This is What's It Like with Dr. Ken Tangen. Hi, this is Ken Tangen. This is episode 30 of What's It Like. My guest is Steve Blank, who is probably best known for startups. Hey, Ken. So how do you start a startup? Um, well, you start a startup about one of 500 different ways. Uh, <laughs> you could have the idea as a founder, and it could be a, something that you've just wanted to do forever. It could be uh, something that uh, somebody walked into your office or room and described their idea, and you kind of said, hey, I want to do that, and that's exciting. Or you and a couple friends could be brainstorming ideas. and So there's no one way to start a company. But in the sum of all those is really that startups are an act of creation. Uh, they're very different than a day job, which is traditionally an act of or series of acts of execution. Startups are very different than that, which is why most people who work in companies actually find it uncomfortable or hard to do. Mm -hmm. How did you start? You didn't begin businesses as a child, I don't suppose, or did you? No, nope, not even a lemonade stand. I had <laughs> it's just a complete accident. So where did you grow up? So I grew up in uh, New York City. So you're a long way from home. Long way from anything any relatives, friends, family ever knew or understood. In fact, um, you know, I did uh, startups for 20 years and um, it wasn't until I retired and actually started teaching at Berkeley and Stanford that my mother finally said, oh, now I understand what you do. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were going to say, she said, now you have a job. Well, she said that too, but <laughs> I thought the most interesting part was now I understand what you do. <laughs> How did your parents influence you? How did they impact your worldview? You know, uh, on one level, they were, uh, you know, I guess small businesses when I was young uh, uh, had a grocery store on the Lower East Side of New York, a typical immigrant experience. And as I was older, they got divorced and my father abandoned the family and my mother essentially um, you know left me to raise myself so I I, I think the influences uh, were not the traditional um, you know growing up in a, in a business family influences mm hmm what about your childhood what was the biggest challenge you know I never did any homework in my life um, and uh, I, I swear I never did a I didn't even know what homework was um, so watching my kids grow up and <laughs> making them do their homework, <laughs> thank God I had a wife who had a normal childhood. Um, and uh, and so I just liked to read a lot, but I was a horrible student. And in hindsight, it was uh, basically because I was just in survival mm -hmm. mode at home. I had no attention at all for class. So, uh, you know, I, I graduated high school out of sympathy rather than grace. <laughs> what did you do after high school? By accident, which was... Um, kind of surprising to me and certainly my classmates uh, I was in New York City high school that had a thousand students in its graduating class and um, you know there was always the top 20 kids you knew who were the smart kids in the school and you know they took all the advanced classes and New York City at the time I don't know if they still did had something called the Regent Scholarship which was essentially a, a scholarship you won by exams um, and so they posted the results um, of exams and you know, if you were in the top what of ten, you won a scholarship, and everybody crowds around looking for their scores. And you know, I started at the bottom, looking up, <laughs> and I, I must have been there <laughs> for about a half hour. And it turned out, out of a thousand students, I was third. Um, and uh, it was the first inkling that you know, I I might have, you know, a couple of neurons that were firing that even I didn't know. So, to make a long story short, I got a scholarship to Michigan State University. Ended up going there as a pre-med, which was the kind of this is what you did if you were uh, an immigrant. So, mm -hmm. And dropped out of a semester. I had a girlfriend who looked at me and said, you know, most of us you know, are working hard to stay here. You don't even look like you like it here. And she was right. And I first realized that I now have permission to start living my life rather than my parents. And I dropped out, and it was middle of a Michigan winter and stuck out my thumb and hitchhiked to... Miami, and after a series of adventures, ended up working at the Miami International Airport, loading racehorses onto cargo planes. When the racing season was over, they shipped them back up north, and you know, when the other season, they flew them back the other way. 
um, and hated the horses, but fell in love with airplanes. And actually, specifically, not the pilots and not even the planes, but all the equipment on it, all the radar and navigation equipment and the rest. And But I realized I would never get a chance to work on it unless I had an education. Mm-hmm. And about that time, we were in the middle of the Vietnam War, and another long story, I ended up volunteering for the military and joining the Air Force in the middle of Vietnam. More adventures, um, you know, thought I was going to be in electronics repairing computers as the recruiter <laughs> promised me as an 18-year-old. <laughs> <laughs> I found myself being assigned. In fact, well, it was electronics, but it was something called electronic warfare, which by accident happened to be the field that was constantly advancing because the North Vietnamese were shooting at our airplanes, and this was the equipment that supposedly protected them. And I ended up um, volunteering to go to Southeast Asia and spent uh, a year and a half on multiple air bases in Thailand learning and teaching and mostly repairing electronics equipment, hmm. which is how I learned electronics. Uh, mm-hmm. The military had a great, essentially a vocational technical school, and, and that was actually what I needed because I, I found my passion in that school and found that I was quite good at in hindsight, troubleshooting was really not fixing a technical problem. It was actually understanding, you know, the big picture of all the possible faults and logically reducing what could be the most likely problem without going through a, you know, they gave you massive technical manuals. But what I discovered intuitively that there was just very quick ways to analyze and fix problems if you understood the system, which would kind of last me my whole life and career. So I spent four years in the Air Force and then um, got out and tried to go back to school, which I did at University of Michigan in in Ann Arbor, and went back this time as a double E and electrical engineer. And uh, I still remember collecting unemployment, being on college work study, and getting the GI Bill. I don't think I made much more money for another five years. (laughs) And by accident, I, um, my college work study job was in the physics department. And after a week or two fixing equipment that they hadn't seen working in years, someone said, you asked me how to do this. I said, yeah. They said, well, how would you like to work on the nuclear reactor? And I went, what? <laughs> <laughs> the university of nuclear reactors. <laughs> Turns out in the 1950s and 60s, the U.S. government and the Atoms for Peace program put research reactors in about 150 universities in and outside the U.S. And this uh, University of Michigan had one, and they had the original scram system or safety system built out of vacuum tubes, and they wanted somebody to rebuild it based on uh, you know, an approved design out of transistors. And so I did that, and I spent almost a decade worrying if I wired it correctly <laughs> until I found out five years ago they actually shut down the reactors and now I'm safe. <laughs> so when did you discover that you're smart? Um, I think standing in um, in front of that Regent Scholarship listing mm-hmm. in uh, literally the last month or two of high school. when And my sister, had who had left home when she was 16, had always said, Listen, you're you're wired differently. You're pretty smart. I just never believed her, because all available evidence at the time, grades, you know, friends, etc. I hung out with the dumb kids who, you know, are now I'm sure janitors or slicing deli meat somewhere, which I think actually they are. <laughs> that was my peer group, and and again, in hindsight, it was because I was probably processing 120 percent of my neurons on just surviving as a, you know, as an a latchkey kid would kind of be a polite description. I kind of now in hindsight realize I was probably living in an outpatient clinic. Mm -hmm. So there wasn't much time to be thinking about other stuff. But in the military, I really got the blossom. I mean, it turns out the U.S. military, and we're seeing it again in Afghanistan and Iraq, happens to be an organization which is incredibly bureaucratic. I mean, the definition of it in peacetime, but in wartime, what we do wonderfully well is we innovate and we p- promote uh, creativity. And so as a 19-year-old, I was managing 20 people and, and um, realized I had a skill, which, as I said, lasted me my, my whole life. Um, and, and it also brought out a couple other things I now understand. I turned into heuristics. One is 
all the conventional wisdom of never volunteer for anything. I volunteered for everything. I mean, that's how I ended up overseas. That's how I ended up managing people. That's how, you know, all my other friends, hey, let's go downtown, go get drunk or other stuff. And I'd go, well, yeah, I'll meet you there later, but I'm going to volunteer to help over here. Why should you do that? You know, that was the other part. It's not only volunteering, but the other thing I learned, uh, again, implicitly is show up a lot. I would just show up a lot where other people go, okay, job's over. What I'd volunteer to do other things, not because I was trying to be good or kiss ass. I mean, I, that never even entered in the calculus. It's because I was interested, and that's the third piece. I was just always curious. I mean, my job didn't end at my job, even if my job didn't include, you know, this part of the equipment. I was always interested in learning it um, and learning something else. Um, and so to me, showing up a lot, volunteering, and intense curiosity kind of drove my entire career. Mm-hmm. And, and those were those are skills that could be learned. I mean, there's nothing in here about being intelligent. It was just none of that was conventional wisdom. Well, military, your first thing you learn is don't volunteer for anything. Show up a lot. Who teaches you that? And show up a lot, I just mean it's not to, you know, whether the boss sees you. It's just put yourself in places where opportunities you can't even predict will happen. And then be curious. It's just, you know, I went from industry to industry just because I was always interested in how does this work or is there a better way to do this or, gee, have somebody thought about this or, gee, I'd like to learn about this. So that's just generic advice. It turns out, personally, the skill I kind of brought in general, which was kind of unique, but I also believe could be taught, was pattern recognition, meaning you know, I'm always gathering a lot of data, and I don't know what goes on in the back of my mind, but you know, disconnected pieces of information somehow connect themselves in new patterns, and I tend to see things. And so most of the, you know, it's there's a fine line between being a visionary and hallucinating, <laughs> and, <laughs> and and you know most of the time it's not clear. Only time will tell. But but that brings up probably the the fourth point, which again is not a skill. It's just something that you could do, and, and that is um, don't be afraid to challenge the status quo. That is, if you do see something that others see, you know the standard in any company or organization is well, that can't be right, or, or you know, the classic, well, we've always done it this way. You know, okay, well, you could go back to work and ignore it, or you could say, no, 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 I'm right, and, and just be not obnoxious, but incredibly persistent about it. My career has great examples of that. Of, I came up with this thing called customer development, which is a new way to think about and teach entrepreneurship. You know, everybody laughed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, Steve, you know, We've been venture capitalists for 30 years. This is how we've always done it. We make a ton of money. Yeah, but I don't think you guys are right. <laughs> Steve, we're a great entrepreneur. Now, this is how we do our business. Now, it's taken 10 years, but the entire venture capital community is kind of now, and entrepreneurs, now kind of do startups more in the way I've been talking about than the way they used to because they've realized that there is a more efficient and more interesting way to, to build companies. You said you're retired, but what exactly do you do? Well, you know, I, I now do what I call drive-by teaching. I, uh, I'm a lecturer at uh, Stanford University in the engineering school, and I also lecture um, at UC Berkeley in the Haas Business School, and then also I lecture in a joint MBA with uh, Berkeley and Columbia Business School in New York. So I do that. And then I sit on, I used to sit on technology um, boards of directors, but I got off of all those, and I now mostly do nonprofit work um, mm. on boards, um, mostly around conservation and, and the environment. Mm. And then I'm also a public official in the state of California. What are you public official of? Yeah, it turns out there's a state agency called the California Coastal Commission, Oh yes, uh, which is kind of the land planning agency for uh, the entire state. And uh, there's a staff of about 120 to 140, depending on their budget and uh, who are staff employees and then uh, who make recommendations to a set of commissioners, 12 of them who are political appointees and I'm one of the 12 uh, coastal commissioners. Uh-huh. You know, the commissioners are, are pretty independent and um, um, I, I think they all take their jobs pretty seriously. It's um, essentially the, 
there's some pristine parts of the California coast, that, not by accident. If you drive north of Santa Barbara, you drive San Mateo County outside of Silicon Valley, Marin, Sonoma, um, you know, these places don't look like that by accident. Yes. California has you know, obviously some of the most overbuilt coastlines in the world, but also stretches that are next to urban areas. They're just unbelievably pristine because of something the people of the state did about 30 years ago, and that mm-hmm. is they passed something called the Coastal Act, which in its preamble has something I don't think anybody's like really spent time thinking about. It, it says the coast of California is a shared resource for all Californians. Does It means it's not just yours it, or mine. It means it's everyone's. Mm-hmm. That's just an amazing thing to put in a preamble um, for a planning document. Um, and then all the authority and power derives uh, from that Coastal Act, but that is, uh, that's kind of right up there. It's kind of shocking to go from a very urban area to these beautiful stretches of beach, but what great fun. Yeah, and you know, what great forethought um, um, the legislature and the people of California had 30 years mm-hmm. ago. In all the things you do, what's the best thing about your job? Well, you know, this is like my third or fourth career. You know, I had a military career. Um, for four years, um, and maybe a a little more extension of it. My first company here in Silicon Valley was in military intelligence, so maybe six, seven years. Then I was an entrepreneur, um, career too, as a uh, joining and then being part of and then starting my own companies, and that lasted 20 years. And then as a teacher, um, that was a third career. I still do that. Um, And I... You know, by now I've had over a thousand students, um, and uh, and then as a public official, um, you know, that's a I'm now in my fifth year as a public official in California, and so, you know, the last two has been as interesting as the first two, uh, hmm. um, but each one has been different, and you know, each one has just almost been different lives. Mm-hmm. Um, so I've. Um, you know, I, I guess that kind of falls into the show up a lot, forever curious, you know, volunteer for everything type, type of thing. Um, you know, and by the way, all this was done without a college degree. Um, you know, I dropped out of Michigan the second time because um, I still didn't have the attention. This time it was just like having come back from Southeast Asia in a war. <laughs> you know, going to school seemed like... <laughs> <laughs> the most boring thing I could have ever done. And in hindsight, I'm sure, and I know I missed a lot since I now teach at three major universities, but, you know, it was the right thing for me. Mm-hmm. So how has entrepreneurship changed over the years? Oh, geez. Um, I, I guess probably the, the biggest change, what I had nothing to do with, is we went from, uh, as an entrepreneur, information scarcity to information overload. Um and then we went from entrepreneurship as a um, unknown, bizarre thing to do to now it's part of the culture. Um, so first, when I I came out to Silicon Valley, you know, no one even knew what Silicon Valley was. I didn't even no one had heard of it. <laughs> um, and two is when you were out here as an entrepreneur, there was no information. I mean, it was basically coffees with your friends or other experienced entrepreneurs. And one of the nice things about the culture was people love to share and pay it forward in terms of helping others. And that's still part of the culture here, but, but there was no internet. There was no books on it. There was no nothing. Um, so you learn by word of mouth. Nowadays, my students, um, suffer from too much information, meaning there's a blog with an opinion that, you know, not a 180 degrees different. There are 360 opinions for each degree and, you know, difference. And so what I try to teach them, is a methodology for sorting through all this information. If you don't have any core beliefs or core strategies, then everything sounds like it's correct. And so you really need to develop some kind of methodology to sort through that. So that's change one. Um, change two is, a, as I said, um, you know, entrepreneurship was something that crazy people did. Mm-hmm. Nowadays, it, it's kind of the cool thing to do. And mm-hmm. I... By the way, I think that's a mistake. Um, 
you know, entrepreneurship, I, every once in a while I get, not every once in a while, almost every quarter, I get students, particularly from business school, say, Professor Blank, I need some career advice. Well, what is it? Well, I'm trying to decide between two jobs. Great. What are they? I've been offered this great job at McKinsey. Wonderful. McKinsey's a great firm. Well, what's the other choice you have? Oh, my roommates uh, are thinking of doing a startup, and I'm thinking of joining them. And I'm they're always, <laughs> well, you decided. They said, well, oh, you haven't heard the idea. I said, no, you decided. Well, how have I decided? I said, you can't have McKinsey and a startup in the same sentence. McKinsey's a job. A startup is a passion. It, it's it's an irrational. Startup's not a job. The confusion is that the culture has made it something that seems exciting. But joining a startup has to be something that you're willing to jettison friends, family, sleep, you know, any other interest, and, and just get deeply involved. You don't get to go home from a startup. You get to go home from a job. Mm -hmm. Can you have a startup if you're old? Sure. Um, though yeah, I think there is enough evidence to say that there are some types of startups, particularly Internet startups, that are, uh, that are best done when you're young. Uh, because the technology is changing so rapidly. So if I was uh, uh, looking at whether to uh, think about the probabilities of some 23-year-old, um, or, or think about 100 startups, so 23-year-olds in web-based Internet startups versus 100 uh, started by 60-year-olds, I'd probably bet on the 100 23-year-olds. Not any particular, but just over time, because the delta rate, not just the rate of change, but the delta rate of change is just enormous. Um, and, and, in, and in fact, in that pile, ex, uh, experience is a burden, not a not a help. Um, mm. um, there are other market segments where that's just inverted, where in fact, experience and wisdom actually do matter. Uh, so I think uh, having this age or age and ageism argument um, really isn't granular enough. There are some where you could just logically make the case that um, it's not about an individual; it's about a group. About a group of a hundred, which one would you rather have working on the problem? Mm -hmm. um, the second is, and, and I'll just observe it in myself, and I think I've seen it generalize, is that when you're young, meaning in your 20s, you're just too stupid to know it can't be done. <laughs> um, no, it, it, don't don't laugh. It's not a joke. Is that when you're old? You, I was remembering. You, yeah, you, 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 when you're old, you know more, and therefore you think that no is a certainty. Um, and and the best experiment in that is that most Nobel Prizes are given for work done by people in their early 20s. Very f That is, don't look at the age that they receive the prize. <laughs> what you want to calculate is the age in which they actually were doing the work. Most of them win it in their early 20s. Um, I, I, again, I don't think it means oh, that every individual who crosses 30 or 40 or 50 isn't creative. I think my best work has been done in the last three or four years. Um, but I think if you just put 100 of me in the room uh, versus 100 20 or 30-year-olds working on something, I'm not sure which group I've been on. I have more questions for Steve Blank. Right after I remind you of the good work being done by St. Jude's. This is a great place that helps lots of children, and you can help them. Go to stjude.org, click on the Donate button. It costs over a million dollars a day to operate St. Jude's. Your contribution with others makes it possible to help kids who otherwise would have no hope. So please, chip in. Go to stjude.org. I also added St. Jude's to my Facebook page. After all, how could you not like St. Jude's? So, Steve... Everyone has to give themselves self-motivation occasionally. How do you give yourself a kick in the pants? And you know, that's a great question. Um, I, I guess my entire life I've been... Um, self-motivated is the wrong word because I never would have used the word motivated. I would have used the word curious. I'm just forever interested in things, you know, like outside, quote, my department, you know, or my job spec. I have always interested. And I think, you know, I've kind of concluded that uh, um, genetically we kind of selected for people like me not being uh, the main part of the, the tribe, but there was always one member of the tribe when we were probably hunting on the savannah, you know, for the last couple hundred thousand years 
there was always one guy that genetically would be interested in what was over the next hill. And, and most of the time, he wouldn't come back because he'd get eaten because it was pretty good at, <laughs> in, in this valley. But every once in a while, that that individual would come back and say, hey, there's more, there's more buffalo over here. Um, and the tribe would move. And, and most, but most of the tribe would be more than happy just hunting or farming wherever they were. It was just great. Uh, I think... Um, you know, that's a almost a entrepreneurship selection. I think mm-hmm. it's, my brain is just kind of wired for. Um, uh, I'm, it's not that I need to overthrow the status quo, but I'm just always interested in in um, in what's next, and maybe that's just motivation. Uh, let me be clear: I've never had a career plan. I had no idea. Not only I would have four major careers, but that even. It, it, when I was doing startups, what the next one would be. I mean, I did two semiconductor companies, a supercomputer company, a video game company, an enterprise software company, never once thinking I was an expert in any of them. In fact, if you look through my history, you would have said, no, gee, you're a semiconductor guy. And I would never think of myself as someone who was an expert in starting chip companies. I just happened to be there. Mm-hmm. Let me turn the question around. How do you calm yourself when you have to soothe yourself? Um, I read and I hike. Um, you know, um, we uh, now live in a um, kind of a pretty tranquil part of the California coast, part that still has uh, lots of bobcat and hunt and coyotes hunt on the front lawn. And, um, you know, and then when we need to, we drive over to Silicon Valley. So uh, reading and and kind of contemplating and connecting with nature is kind of what just recharges my battery. Mm-hmm. Is there an event in your life that has challenged you to the core? You know, having two children um, <laughs> <laughs> is always a challenge, um, you know, particularly because I had no um, um, role models for what good parenting looked like. Um, mm-hmm. um, you know, luckily I married a woman and still married the same woman who just a wonderful mother and wife who had great instincts and grew up well. And, you know, they would smack me in the head and say, no, 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 you're supposed to talk to them. <laughs> or you're supposed to read them story. Really? Is that was just, okay. And <laughs> it's so, so, um, uh, you know, I've always like just enjoyed having my kids around. I think that, that was, uh, that was kind of a, a basic heuristic. I, I decided mm-hmm. and it turned out that they were enjoyable to have around, but you know, like all kids, they've had challenges, both, you know, growing up and health issues, et cetera. And, um, you know, that having a family always always adds perspective and, and brings your core values front and center. That's true. If you're giving a commencement speech for high school or college, what would you give as your best advice? What would you say? You know, I, I just did a commencement speech, actually. <laughs> and, uh, and so thank you for asking. Sure. I, the ones I, I started with... Um, you know, um, you know. Even though you just got your degree, um, no one in the world really gives a damn about your grades or how popular you were or what teams you were on. Um, it's now your turn. It's about it's about you showing up. It's about volunteering. Um, it's about being creative and figuring out what's over the next hill. Um, and um, you know, just enjoy it because there's no undo button. I want to thank Steve Blank for joining me. Thanks, Steve. I really appreciate it. All right. Thank you.